I've been meaning to ask. Ooh, when I hear that kind of an opening, my heart sings. Have you? Have you been thinking of me? I've been meaning to ask can mean so many wonderful, inviting things. It can mean I've been thinking about you. It can mean I'm curious and I care. As our worship series enters its second half, we move from the curious opening, where are you from, deeper to where does it hurt? Now we move to the possible call for action or maybe a plea for inaction. What do you need? So stick around as we consider how we identify what we need and how we can listen deeply as others tell us what they need. We'll also look to the pages of scripture to find times when people are able to give only what is needed or identify what they need. Hi, I'm Heather Bales Baker. I serve alongside Cape Codders and Wash Ashores, lifelong United Methodists, and those who are new to the faith, the people of the United Methodist Church. In the midst of a weird and wacky year, we remain together in Christ and committed to serve. I am excited to share that next Sunday, August 1st, we will be gathering in our sanctuary at 57 Pond Street for the first time since March 8th, 2020. Please check the comments below for more information. We will continue to offer opportunities for worship online and outdoors for those who cannot join us in person or inside. now a time just for our young and curious at heart. What do you need? Tell me if this has ever happened to you. You're doing something, sitting in class, having lunch, or just going for a walk, and you stop what you're doing, and you turn to the grown-up and you say, Mom, Dad, Nana, Teacher, and they look at you and they say, Yes, what do you need? Or maybe you wake up in the middle of the night and you go and you wake up your grown-up and in their sleepy voice they say, what is it? What do you need? And sometimes you know the answer. Can I have a drink? Will you sing me a song? Can we go for a walk? And sometimes, let me guess, you don't know. We don't always know what we need and we don't always know what other people need. But sometimes we guess. Sometimes we try things that have worked before. A drink of water, a kiss on the head, a song to sing, a hug can help with a lot of things. Now, let me ask you one more thing. Have you ever been really upset, like crying so hard you can't speak? Or maybe you're just really tired and you can't get the right words out. And the person that you're talking to just keeps guessing and getting it wrong. Now, sometimes I do this with my kids. I want to help so badly that I stop listening and I try to figure it out. And sometimes it can even get kind of silly. Do you need a Band-Aid, a Playmate, a lemonade? Do you wanna to go to the zoo, be part of my crew? Do you wanna do the do? Do you need to take a bath? Do you wanna explore the path? Do you want something to eat, maybe a little meat? And on and on and on, I guess. And they get frustrated, and so do I. And sometimes, instead of guessing, I just need to stop, slow down, quiet down, 
and wait until they can tell me what they need. What do you need? Here's your challenge for the week. Are you ready? With your grown-up's help, choose a time and a person to ask, what do you need? And then here's the hard part. Listen. Really listen for the answer. Maybe you can do whatever it is that they need. Like sometimes I need a hug and I know you guys can do that. And maybe you can't do what it is that they need. And sometimes that doesn't feel really good to not be able to help. But you can definitely listen and let the person know they are not alone. Remember, what do you need is just one more way we say, I love you. I miss you guys. You are energetic, earnest, efficient, and electric. You are God's beautiful beloveds. Hi, my name is Remington, and I am a healthcare chaplain in Austin, Texas. I've been serving at the bedside of the sick and the dying for the past 10 years. I'm a Presbyterian pastor, and I'm currently working on a Master's of Nursing from the University of Texas. I've been meaning to ask, what do you need? It's a big deal. I know for me, there are many times until I'm asked what I need, I don't stop to think about it. I've been at the hospital doing family conference and crisis and this and that, and it's not until someone pulls me aside and says, Remington, what do you need? And even then, my first response is usually, I need the neurologist. I need the neurologist to show up. Tell me when they're going to be here because I've got 20 people in the waiting room and we need a neurologist to lead the family conference. And they'll say, okay, okay, yeah, but what else do you need? And say, that's right, ooh, I need french fries. I need french fries, that's what I need. And then sometimes in those stiller moments, the answer is when someone asks me what I need, it's a bigger existential thing. I need to know what God wants from me in this life. I need to know that my life has meaning. I need to know that my child's going to grow up healthy and, and, and do good in the world. And I need to know that I'm loved and I'm safe. And, <laughs> and they look back and they say, oh, I was, I mean, I just kind of go to the cafeteria here. Um, I can do the fries. Um, but uh, thanks for sharing the rest of that. <laughs> when we ask people about their needs, it's a really special thing. I would say it's even a sacred thing because it, 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 it can connect us into a relationship with one another. Because on both sides of the question, the one asking the question and the one receiving the question, there is intention and consent. So if I'm the one asking, what do you need? I'm putting myself in a place where I don't know what you're going to say. Now, of course, I can sort of bracket it. So, hey, I'm running to the kitchen. Uh, do you need anything? And then they can answer. And what I'm telling them is, if there's something in the kitchen, I will grab it for you. If it's not in the kitchen, I'm not getting it. That's not on the table of things that you can tell me that you need. But it can also be a very broad, just tell me what do you need? What do you need? And I don't know. So it is an act of faith and curiosity and respect when I offer that to somebody else. Now, as the person who is asked that, I also have a choice. I get to say, yes, no, maybe. I can choose to enter into this relationship. I can choose to respond. And then I get to choose the level of vulnerability and the depth and the breadth to how I respond. So if I'm feeling safe and secure and it's someone that I, I know loves me and cares for me and I'm in the right place, I may respond with a whole litany of things, everything from these are the things that I need from the kitchen when you go get them to these are the ex existential desires and longings of my soul, everything in between. And I think that's the really special part about leaning into one another and offering ourselves to listen because sometimes the thing that they want is not found in the kitchen. It's not found in the french fries. It's something that can't happen. I can't heal your parent who's been in that bed for two weeks. I can't fix overnight a systemic system that oppresses folks. Um, 
And so sometimes all I can do is witness the fact that you have this need and I can hear it and I can hold it and be another person who knows that you have that need. And while yes, we want the systemic issues with oppression to be wiped away, we want this inbreaking kingdom, we want things to be beautiful and wonderful and safe, and we want folks to have health and well-being and all the good things, but sometimes we're just not in a place to be able to do those. But it can't stop us from stepping in with intention and faith to lean in and to connect with one another and to ask, what do you need? Amen? Amen. How many of you have ever had a bad day and found someone offering you unsolicited advice? How many of you have ever had a bad week and had someone rush in with dozens of suggestions for you for how you might fix things, as if you hadn't thought of that before? We've all been there and we've all done it. It is part of our humanity. Our scripture reminds us today that often in the face of hurt, what people really need is not a list of advice or solutions, but the simple presence of love. So let us pray to God, acknowledging that we are works in progress and that relationships always come with mistakes and confession. Let us pray. Gracious God, sometimes life feels like cooking with flour. It looks like it should be easy, but we always make a mess. This is particularly true when it comes to our relationships. We so desperately long to say the right thing, to be the right thing, to find the right solution that we overstep the line. Forgive us for assuming the place you fill. Forgive us for imagining that we and all our humanity could possibly fix all the hurt in this world. Instead, give us the grace and the strength to stand by our loved ones in their moments of need, to witness their hurt without trying to fix it. You are God. We are not. Teach us how to be a friend. Teach us how to ask, what do you need? Teach us how to point to you. Gratefully, we pray. Amen. Family of faith, no matter how many times you have spoken without listening, assumed without knowing, offered without asking, or rushed without waiting, you are forgiven. God knows your desire and your intent. God knows when we try and miss the mark, and God surrounds us in grace. So hear and believe the good news of the gospel. Every day is a new day for love. We are claimed. We are forgiven. We are invited into relationship. Thanks be to God for growth and grace that knows no end. Amen. As you hear our scripture today, we will again practice Visio Divina, praying with our eyes, pondering the image as the Spirit speaks through God's word and the artist interpretation. Our first piece, a digital painting with mixed media collage, is titled Break Open by the Reverend Liesel Gwyn Garrity, inspired by Job 2, verses 11 through 13. Liesel writes, The day my grandmother died, my mother-in-law called. My grandmother died peacefully in old age, and yet my mother-in-law knew the significance of her loss. She knew how my grandmother had helped raise my sister and me when our mother died when we were young. She knew that my grandmother was the matriarch of my large extended family and that her death would usher in a new reality for us. She knew that my grief for my mother, well-worn and familiar, would bleed into this new unfamiliar grief. She knew that losing my grandmother would feel like losing a parent all over again. I missed her call, but she left a voicemail. Softly, her voice message began, Liesl, I just heard about your Nana. Then her voice cracked. She sighed and she began to weep. After a few moments of weeping quietly, she found her words again. Anyway, I love you. Call me if you want to talk. I don't remember much of what others have said to me in the fresh fog of grief, but I will never forget that. In a way, she didn't need to ask me what I needed. Without assumption or question, she simply entered into my pain and joined me there. Her profound act of solidarity gave me a great comfort when little comfort was to be found. In this image, I wanted to evoke the emotional impact 
of rending one's clothing in solidarity with someone who is hurting. While this ancient cultural practice might feel curious to us now, I love that it's an embodied way to tear away the armor that guards our own hearts so we can truly show up tenderly to join one another in their pain. If you are hurting right now, may this image remind you, you are not alone. God's heart is breaking open for you. Our first reading today is found in Job chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. Now when Job's three friends heard of all these troubles that had come upon him, each of them set out from his home, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Namathite. They met together to go and console and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him, and they raised their voices and wept aloud. They tore their robes and threw dust in the air upon their heads. They sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. Our second piece is Paul in Prison by Reverend Lauren Wright Pittman. It is inspired by 2 Timothy chapter 4, 9 through 18. This work is hand-carved blocks printed with oil-based ink on paper. Lauren writes, Paul's actions have returned to him. While in a position of power as Saul, he persecuted people of faith and now he sits alone at the end of his life, beaten and imprisoned for his own beliefs. It would make sense to me that Paul would be in turmoil, filled with guilt for his former actions and troubled with resentment. He lists people who have abandoned him, which might have led him to instruct Timothy to write it all. However, Paul chooses another way. May it not be counted against them. Perhaps Paul is able to offer forgiveness because of the blinding forgiveness he himself received Maybe because he forgave himself, too. What does Paul need at the end of his days? He needs companionship, and he needs it quickly. He needs his cloak to wrap around his battered body and the company of books to keep his imagination engaged. He needs parchments to share his wisdom and to proclaim the good news. He could have passed on bitterness to Timothy, but instead expresses gratitude for God's provision. I believe the foundational need of this text is the need for forgiveness. Forgiveness transforms Paul's life. It enables him to seek companionship and comfort instead of vengeance. And it is the essence of the message he carries. In this block print, I carved Paul writing the letter to Timothy. The lines of his skin echo the twists and turns of his life while the lines on the page give him release. The cell bars obscure the view, however, the light of his halo and the power of his letter cannot be contained. His hand reaches just beyond one of the bars because in receiving forgiveness, reaching out for companionship and letting go of guilt and resentment, he is free. Our second reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 18. Do your best to come to me soon for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone on to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful in my ministry. I have sent Tychicus to Ephesus. If you come, bring my cloak that I left in Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all the parchments. Alexander, the coppersmith, did me great harm. The Lord will pay him back for his deeds. You also must beware of him, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. What do you need? The life and work of a pastor is many things, but it is seldom boring. One of the more interesting parts of my job is cold calls. When someone unknown to me calls to ask for something or walks in through the doors of the church looking for something. 
In 19 years of professional ministry, I have been asked for all kinds of things. Can I have a ride? Sure. Can you do a funeral, a wedding, a baptism? Yes, maybe. Let's talk about what those things mean. Could you check on my parents, my grandparents, my neighbor? Sure, I can do that. Can you help me with my genealogy project? Maybe. Can you help me out with, with rent, with groceries, with gas money? Sometimes. Other cold calls can lead to huge investments of time, energy, and resources. Can we build a Habitat for Humanity house together? Well, you, me, 15 other churches worth of volunteers and financial support, you betcha. I was once asked, can you get to a nearby federal prison in an hour or so and during visiting hours do a wedding? They then asked my rate and on hearing it, we're no longer interested. I was outbid before I truly knew what was needed. Another time a man asked if I could baptize his neighbor's children. Yes, of course, have the family come and see me and get to know our church, find out what baptism means. Actually, he said, he meant, could I baptize them in secret while their mom was napping or before she got up in the morning? She didn't need to know, did she? No, I don't baptize against someone's will and we should definitely talk about what baptism means and what it means to be a good neighbor. To call someone, to walk through the door of an unknown church and ask for help is a brave and risky thing. Try it and you will see. It is hard to ask for help. It is hard to verbalize what you need, especially to someone you don't know. Early in my ministry, a parishioner asked me to participate in the March of Dimes Jail and Bail program. Don't worry, they said. They take it easy on first timers. You just go in, get sentenced, pay your bill, and you're, and you're home for lunch. So I did. I was new to the community. It was a chance to meet more people in the community, right? As I left, our church admin handed me a church directory, just in case, she said mysteriously. Then I was picked up in a cop car, drove to the, driven to the hotel for sentencing, and my bail was set higher than I could afford. I had to call church members and ask them to contribute to the cause. Now, it was nothing like the real experience of asking someone to pay my bail, and yet it was terrifying to call and ask, will you help? To hear parishioners say to me, what do you need? I need money to support a good cause. Can you help? What do you need? It can be hard to ask and harder to answer because what if their answer is too much, more than you have, more than you want to give? And to answer, to answer the question, what do you need? It requires us to admit, to be honest and vulnerable in our need. We need something, we need and to answer this question, what do you need, also requires us to know what we need. And how often do we not know? Certainly there are those moments when we walk into a room and have no idea why we're there, what we have come into the room to ask, to get. And there are those moments when we stand in front of the fridge or the cupboard and wonder, what do I want? What do I need? How many of us have discovered in the last 18 months how often our eating and drinking has very little to do with hunger and thirst and a whole lot to do with anxiety, stress, boredom, loneliness, isolation, uncertainty, and so on. I eat because I'm hungry, but also because I'm tired, I'm homesick, I'm stressed. Not because I need food, not because my body needs nourishment, but because my heart, my soul, my mind wants comfort, escape something to do. What do you need? In our text this morning, we see Job's friends get it really, really right. They say nothing. They just show up and sit with Job in his grief and in his pain. Now, if you keep reading the book of Job, and I suggest that you do, you'll see that these friends go from getting it right to getting it spectacularly wrong. But that hasn't happened yet. Right now, they're just getting it right. Job needs company. He needs consoling. He needs comfort. And from his three friends, he gets it. And Paul, I love this bit of writing from Paul. He's alone and he wants Timothy to come. Please come, please come quickly. And then he also wants his coat, his books, his papers. 
It is so stinking real. It is so human. This is Paul who wrote, love is patient, love is kind. This is Paul who wrote about the body of Christ and its many members. And in this, we see the human Paul, the man who is cold and alone, possibly afraid. This shows us that Paul is as human as you and I are. And it shows us something too about Timothy who is receiving this letter, Paul, trust Timothy. Paul trusts Timothy enough to ask him for help, to tell him what he needs, what he wants. And it makes you wonder, doesn't it? What exactly did Alexander the coppersmith do to Paul? I wish he had taken just another moment to tell us the story. It's so tantalizing. Can't you imagine Timothy asking once he's arrived, once he's settled in, tell me about this coppersmith, asking for more details of the story about those who abandoned Paul. Where did they go? Why did they leave? Were they furthering the mission? Were they taking care of themselves? But Paul isn't bad-mouthing them. He doesn't need revenge. God will take care of them. And and sometimes it sounds like a promise, other times it sounds like a threat. I still want to know more. I don't need to know, but I am curious. What do you need? What do you need to get through the day? What do you need to survive? What's more, what do you need to thrive as a whole person, body, mind, and soul? What would it really mean to ask for what we need? And what would it mean to ask others, what do you need? And to really, really listen to the answer. I was stopped just a week or so ago by a man who sat outside a store and I expected him to ask me for money. I almost missed his answer entirely because internally I was re rehearsing the resources that are available in our community. When I stopped my internal listing and started genuinely listening, he wasn't asking me for money. He wanted to ask me about my mask, a rainbow mask I was wearing. He didn't need my money. He needed me to listen, to see him, to see his daily struggles, to see his hurt and pain. He needed to tell me a story. What do you need? What would it mean to ask your friends and your family? What would it mean to ask our community, our neighbors, what would it mean to ask the person who disagrees with you theologically, politically, ideologically? How often do our debates come, back, come down to what we think we know about the other person's beliefs? But what if we went deeper? What if we truly asked one another, what do you need? I think we'd find we have so much more in common on a level of need, like plants. We all need to be fed and watered. We need to be sheltered from the elements. We need to know that our lives have value, that we are valued. We need to know that our children are safe and thriving. We need hope, joy, and love. These needs are the same no matter what political party you tend to vote. These needs are the same no matter how you practice your faith. These needs are the same no matter what beautiful color of skin we wear. What would it mean to ask creation herself? What do you need? I hope, I hope the last 18 months has provided a deeper focus of what we need, more than what we want, but what we need to survive and thrive. What do you need? Dare to ask and then listen. Listen, listen, listen to the answer. Here, if you need me, a prayer poem. I got the call and almost rushed right over. I wanted to hold your hand and tell you it would be okay. I wanted to start a meal train. I wanted to bring casseroles and flowers and hope of better days. I wanted to take my heart out of my chest and put it in yours so that the ache might fade. I wanted to speak and fight with the person in charge. I wanted to get justice. I wanted to make it fair. I wanted to start a campaign. I wanted to rewind time to easy, better days. There is so much that I want to do, but it's not about me, it's about you. So tell me, what do you need? I'm here, I'm listening. Will you pray with me? God of the here and now, 
My, oh my, how we need you. This world seems to turn upside down all the time. Our center of gravity feels off. In moments like these, we are particularly grateful for the care you offer and the stability of friends. So today we say a prayer of thanks for the people in our lives who take the time to ask, what do you need? For the grocery store clerk who helps load our cars, for the neighbor across the street who leaves sidewalk chalk no notes, for the friend in the pew who texts when we're not there, for parents and children who celebrate the good in life, for teachers who pay attention, for mentors who offer their support. Gracious God, help us to be those people for others. Give us the eyes to see when our neighbors are in need and the wisdom to ask, what do you need? Stop our assumptions cold in their tracks and instead carve out space in us to listen. We are practicing breathing deeply. We are practicing being still. We are practicing opening ourselves to you. We are practicing listening slowly and intentionally. We are practicing sitting with our pain and honoring it. We are practicing saying what we need and not being afraid to ask for help. And in all of this, we need you. Oh, how we need you. So gather us in and hold us close. Be with us in our waiting and in our praying. Be with us in our grief and our sorrow. Be with us in our relationships that we might be blessed with friends who support us and that we might be the friends who can bless others. With deep gratitude and with true humility, we pray the words your son taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as, as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, bread. And, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as, we as we forgive those who trespass against us. us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. From evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the, power, and the glory, glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 When we love someone in need, it is easy to give. We show up with casseroles and prayer shawls. We send cards and make phone calls. We babysit the kids and drop off flowers. We don't think twice about it because when we love someone in need, it is easy to give. In worship, when we give to the offering, what we are also declaring is not just that those we love are worthy of our gifts, but God is worthy of our gifts. And strangers whom we have never met are worthy of our gifts in worship. When we give to the offering, we are declaring that all of creation deserves love and care, which is a radical notion in this hurting world. So today, as a way to practice being in relationship and drawing closer to one another, I invite you to give to the mission and ministry of this church, God's church. For when we love, it is always easy to give. Stand by me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the world is tossing me like a ship upon the sea, thou who rulest wind and waters, stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. Of tribulation, stand by me. When the hosts of sin sail and my strength begins to fail, thou who never lost a battle, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. The best I can, and my friends who misunderstand, thou who knowest all about me, stand by me. When I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. When I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. When my life becomes a burden, and I'm near and chilly. Stand by me. 
family of faith, as you leave this moment of worship, this sacred pause, may God grant you the curiosity to counter assumptions, the vulnerability to befriend, the bravery to speak your truth, the wisdom to listen, the strength to ask for help, the resiliency to choose love even when it's hard, and the awareness of the Holy Spirit always beside you. In the name of the great connector, love itself, go in peace, knowing this, God loves you, and so do I. Amen.